So we're in Niagara Falls during Christmas time. Not exactly a normal thing to do, but that's what we do here. So we're gonna go to the Whirlpool Rapids. There's uh, so this is the escarpment right here. We're gonna talk a little about the about the erosion of the escarpment and how the escarpment is formed. So basically, in BC, where I shoot a lot of my channel. A lot of the formations that we look at, like mountains and canyons and everything else, is due to faulting, right? Tectonic activity with the, the plates in the earth. But the escarpment is not due to tectonic activity. It's strictly due to erosion. And it's erosion from water. And if you look over there, you'll see a massive amount of water. So Lakes Superior, Michigan, and Erie and here on as well. So four of the five Great Lakes drain out of Niagara Falls right here. So you, literally all four like Great Lakes, if you added up all the water, all of that water is being pushed out towards the St. Lawrence. So it comes down off the falls, follows the Niagara River into Lake Ontario, and then from Lake Ontario goes out to the St. Lawrence. And then from there, you've got the Atlantic Ocean. And then across the pond there, you've got our friends in Britain. Many, 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 many millions of years ago, this Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, and Lake Erie used to be a massive saltwater lake. And they had limestone rock. There was limestone in the lake. Yeah. And the salt water brined the limestone and metamorphosized the limestone rock into a different type of rock called dolostone. Okay. And the dolostone is really, really, really dense. And so this dolostone sits on top of the shale and it compresses everything. And then as the river flows through, flows by the rock face, it erodes the soft shale underneath of it and it, it just collapses in a certain way that the escarpment forms. And same with rainwater. There's carbon dioxide in the air. As rainwater falls through the air, the carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the water yeah. and it becomes acidic and then that rainwater hits the rock face and the acidity of the rainwater the car it's called carbonic acid basically just erodes the cliff face away but the dolostone on top is is really dense and really heavy and really thick so right. that's how that's why you get the escarpment because that heavy dolostone on top is keeping it keeping the escarpment from getting washed away completely so this is the Niagara Escarpment, the Niagara River. You can actually see the hard layer of dolostone on the uh, on the top of the escarpment and the shale rock underneath. And that hard layer of dolostone compresses the shale, which keeps the escarpment intact. That hard dolostone cap, it basically keeps the shale and all the other layers from eroding. But then you've got the river, the Niagara River, and the erosive force of the river erodes the escarpment. And with Niagara Falls, you've got the water pouring over the Dolestone cap, and then all the mist and backwash from the falls erodes the shale rock underneath, which then breaks off and you know undermines the Dolestone. So it breaks off in chunks and gets washed away. And then the other type of erosion that we'd have would be wind erosion, particulate matter, which is very, very, very erosive as well and then carbonic acid, rainwater. So between rainwater, wind erosion, and the Niagara River, this is how the escarpment is formed. And you can see the cable car across the uh, the canyon. So, and you can actually see the hard layer of dolostone on the top, and then the shale rock underneath, and you can actually see it uh, degrading at a faster rate. And you can see where it's broken off in chunks. And Niagara Falls used to be here. It carved all of this out and will continue to carve all the way to Lake Erie and then eventually, but none of us will ever see that. And I don't think our future generations will even see that. It's a long, long, long way away. See, see the hard layer? See yeah. how that, that hard layer of dolostone? Yeah. And yeah. then the shale? That compresses the shale, which yeah. holds the escarpment together. And then the erosive force of the water carves the canyon out. This is not tectonic. None of this was ever made by tectonic activity. It, does, it doesn't happen here. This is all from water. Strictly water and wind erosion. It's gorgeous to do this in the morning too, with the sunrise. Usually you'll see whirlpools in the canyon, but there's no whirlpools. They've reduced the water even more right now because it's winter. 
to reduce the stress. Oh, with the ice. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you can see the level should be, we see these bleached rocks down there. Yeah. That's where it should be. That's where it should be, yeah. Uh, Ni Niagara Falls is the emptying. All of the Great Lakes empty out of Niagara Falls. Four out of the five lakes are, are coming out of there. Yeah, and look at the layering of the escarpment too. That's gorgeous. Wow. Look at the rock. A few hundred feet down too. That's probably two, three hundred feet at least. Alrighty, so just walking down the escarpment here towards the falls. We're just heading down this front front view, right up the front of the window here. So we're gonna go to the Niagara Powerhouse, the original one, the mother of all powerhouses in the world. This is where hydropower was started. So if you guys have seen my sand in video, which if you have not, make sure you go check out on the channel there. Tesla was working out his research there for the electric motors and what was the best way to produce power with you know cycle of electricity three phase versus single phase and that was in 1897 that he was doing that in Sandon but in Niagara Falls which is early 1900s is when all of that work kind of came to the forefront and came out in what we know today for modern power generation. He was the one that recommended that instead of single phase, they go to three phase, which allows you to generate three times as much power than single phase. So that's pretty self-explanatory. That way is the most simplest way I can explain it. And Thomas Edison's experimental research laboratory was actually in Buffalo. There's a Nikola Tesla statue here. Nikola Tesla Plaza. So that's Nikola Tesla standing on top of a motor. Alrighty, so we're just coming up to the front of the powerhouse here. This is where it all started. The plant was designed by Algernon S. Bell, inspired by the Adams Generating Station. Yeah, I was just reading it. Okay. They have rotors with 10 electromagnets in them that would spin 250 revolutions a minute. Right from the water turning the turbine in the shaft down below. And of course they act on three phases of electrical wire around the outside to produce 25 hertz, which they produce for 100 years here. Yeah, it's so crazy that it was 25 hertz. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's really weird. Really the water came in from that side of the building underneath the floor where our washrooms and gift shop is today. About a story and a half down and then enter these great big pipes called pen stocks that you see out here. And that you also see out back in the background behind that shaft. So the pen stocks are massive, they're 10 feet in diameter, filled with 80,000 gallons of water. And they took that water on a 136 foot drop where it elbowed into a big Francis turbine in a scroll case. So the water turned the turbine, turbine turned that shaft, and then of course turned the rotor with the electromagnets up above on the generating floor, those alternators. That's our gear deck. It controlled ring valves to fine tune the water going in to that turbine, make sure it's spinning the right speed for the equipment above and the turbines behind that big scroll case there. So once the water emptied out of all 11 turbines, it emptied out into that big pit you see out back. Now that's not the tunnel, that's actually called the wheel pit, part of our building. 600 feet long and all that generating equipment is over top and as you can see on the way down into the pit. And the slope of that wheel pit pushed all that water up to 800,000 gallons a minute. This way, yep. out. out of our wheel pit, we're underneath alternator one right now and into the big tunnel and it took it on its 730 yard or 1200 foot journey back to the river below the falls. So wow. all we did really was take water above the falls, mimic the drop of the falls to turn those turbines and gave it right back. Okay. Yeah. So you have a beautiful view when you get to the edge, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it kind of takes a brothel tunnel down a notch. Just about to exit the tail race here. That's where we just came out of. You can see, that's the escarpment. See how it's undermining? See how the see how it, see how that's right there. See how that's undermining itself and the top layer is holding yeah. it all in place? I guess they can call it off the walls, eh? That's what it is. And then there's
there's the falls. So it's basically another Niagara Falls viewpoint now. We're right down by the falls now, guys. Up to that rock, that's nuts. Fort Niagara, are we doing this? Uh, this is uh, Niagara Park. Niagara Park, yeah. Yeah, yeah there are. They're quasi-government agency, but they don't take tax dollars. They are fully self-funded, and that was their mandate uh, from day one in 1885 when they were formed. Right. Yeah. Nice. So it's back then they were allowed to um, raise funds through what they called reasonable tolls. Okay. All right. Um, and through attractions. And so today there's no tolls. It's, uh, so it's all because attractions. yeah because it yeah. was supposed to be yeah. Uh, yeah. all free and open to the public that was yeah. the official mandate for the park area right uh, because they wanted to get away from some of the tourist operators that were operating oh, yeah. there and extorting people and yeah. things like that so yeah. back in 1885 they formed at that time the Queen Victoria Parks Commission okay it's so good they did it because he got one yeah. chance to do that and then yes. you don't you never get right. back DC current versus alternating current. Edison invents the first electric light bulb powered by DC. US Nikola Tesla applies for patents for AC. Westinghouse buys his patents. Edison fights Westinghouse. And Westinghouse outbids Edison for the Chicago World Fair. The Tesla coil, invented in 1891 that was designed to produce bolts of high voltage, low current electricity, and used two coals to generate an open air spark and shot lightning bolts that could supply wireless power. The oil switch cabinets. The oil switches connected the electricity produced in the power station to the transmission grid via bus bars beneath the generating floor. Similar to a subway system, the bus bars extended full length of the power station and routed the electricity to the grid outside. The oil switch tank safely opened and closed high voltage circuits during generating cycles as the consumer demand for power fluctuated over the course of the day. Each switch was contained within its own chamber, built multiple layers of protection against fire and explosions. Because they're just full of oil, and the oil was an insulator. To close an oil switch, the motorized mechanism at the top of the chamber dropped down and pressed against the fixed brass rod, the cylinder below. As the mechanism made larger surface contact with the cylinder, switch terminals connected to the brass rods submerged under oil inside the cylinder. The closed terminals allowed the electric current to throw through the circuit. To open an oil switch, the motorized mechanism lifted from the cylinder and released the tension on the brass, causing the switch terminals to open. Electric arcs caused by opening the switches were suffocated by the oil in the cylinder. Extinguishing electric arcs were critical to avoid flammable or explosive combination of fuel and air. Modern hydro stations use oil switches that look similarly but operate differently. They are motorized and use a vacuum system instead of a cylinder to break the currents instead of mineral oil. Modern switches with vacuum circuit breakers also have mineral arcing characteristics. The arc quenches when it is stretched. These switches are frequently used to switch gear up to 40,500 volts. You can see inside. Yeah, and you'll see a governor for each generator, right? And the governor is responsible for keeping it at 250 RPM. That's what they wanted. That was the optimum rotation speed for the generators. It's all about how much power they wanted to produce, and that's why they needed the 250 RPMs per minute. So it's important that they monitor that, because otherwise the electrical fluctuates too much. So 25 hertz to 60 hertz. So despite the efforts of early inventors, no single frequency prevailed in the early years of power generation. There's 66 hertz, 25 hertz, 50 hertz. Um, it was all over the place. In North America was 25 cycle and Europe was 50 cycle power. Stopped being used in the European standard by 1914 due to its application outside of factories. Then the 60 hertz was implemented by Tesla. He kind of figured out that 60 hertz should be the standard for it. This wheel worked like an emergency parking brake to slow down the shaft turning beneath the generator. Similar to a drum brake on a car. This 
is a modern day control switch. Right? So you've got start, stop, exciter, raise, lower. So that's to energize your magnets. The ring valve, that's to slow the flow coming in to the turbine. And the head gate is to slow the amount of water coming into the dam itself. The brakes, the computer, and the turbine. And then codes. So yeah, you've seen this many, many times. Generator, and then look at the water. The, the turbine is way, way below. That tunnel that we were walking through, the water comes down below, it's just below us, comes down all the way into here and then spins the turbine. And then it exits out the tail race. And then this one, when this turbine spins, it spins this shaft, which rotates the rotor, which generates power, right? These are the circuit breakers covered in oil. Electromagnetic motor, patented May 1st, 1888. Before this invention, electric motors rotated by gradually shifting poles within the motor. Tesla made improvements to that design with this invention that used the shifting of the motor's magnetic poles to create and maintain rotation by direct attraction. So if you worked in a powerhouse, you had to be strong because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be manhandling those things with torque bolts. And these are fabricated. These guys cut these. Oh, alternating curtain voltage tester. These old things. Electric arc welder. Okay, so the rotor holds 10 magnets. It spins at 250 RPM and the stator stays fixed and has three sets of copper wire. And the magnets moving past the stationary copper wire induces an electromagnetic field which generates power. And the governor is responsible for keeping it at 250 RPM. That's what they wanted. That was the optimum rotation speed for the generators. Really important to mention is the exciter. So to get these generators going, for them to work, to generate power, you need to excite the magnets within the generator. So an exciter is a dynamo generator that functions like a battery inside a generator. So these generators will not work by themselves. They're too big. They need, they need to have current impressed into the magnets. It uses direct current power to create a steady magnetic field that jump starts the generator. When spinning an exciter, it can reach up to 600 rotations per minute. And the rotations per minute is key for the how much power you're outputting. Although the power station had five exciter units, only four operated at one time. The fifth exciter was a spare in case one of the other units malfunctioned. The exciters were controlled by two control panels, including one on the plant's main floor level and another in the control room. These were important pieces of machinery and also empowered the head gates and the cranes. So it's funny, you need DC power to make AC power. That Tesla generator we saw in Sandin, part of the reason that's so special is that it doesn't need an exciter. But these ones do because of the way they work. All right, so we finished up the powerhouse now, yeah. and then we're gonna be heading over to uh, Goderich. What I will say is we're gonna go see the world's largest underground salt mine, but I'll leave it at that.